Yeah, great. Uh, take it away, Drew. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, well, welcome everybody to the members meeting this this month. It's good to see everyone. It's a fantastic turnout. Uh, for those who don't already know me, my name is Drew, and it is my privilege to serve as the party president for the moment. Tonight we have at least ten speakers, I believe, if my list is accurate. Uh, I'll go through a bit. We've got uh, Sundance, Bilson Thompson, talking about transport cycling and the social harm of helmets. Miles talking about fusion as a movement. Owen on software undermining our society. Mark Miller on the clean energy transition. Andre Leong on cellular agriculture. Angus on cannabis driving law reform. Laura Layton on RNA therapeutics. Yuki Kitano on AI safety. Brianie Edwards on the three R's of climate rescue. Tyrone Delisle on an argument for lifting the ban on nuclear energy. Cami Cordner Hunt on the unaccountability of corporations in the commitment of human rights abuses. And I believe John August on foreign policy and economics. As a small disclaimer, these are presented as talks from various people and interested members. These are not formal uh, fusion policy positions or anything like that. Please do not read into them. <laughs> <laughs> that uh just as a you know official disclaimer oh actually drew on that point um would you like to do a bit of a like a bio intro before each person comes on <laughs> further distance ourselves from uh, controversial opinions maybe <laughs> uh, i'll ask people to give them give themselves a a very short intro that won't be part of their timed speech uh i, I wouldn't want to speak for everyone on this list so that'll be fine um the, the actual talks will be limited to ideally five minutes. Um, I'll give a little warning ping, uh, about 30 seconds left. If you run a little bit over, I'm not going to cut you short, but if you run over like a large amount, uh, we'll ping you a bit more aggressively. Um, we'll allow a couple minutes for questions on each one, but we've got a lot of people to uh, talk. So we're going to be a little bit pressed for time. So we'll try and keep it moving. So. Uh, if any of the speakers would like to volunteer to go first, speak up. Otherwise, I will roll the dice in a moment. I'll go first. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Bryony. Okay. Um, I'm just going to get, is it okay if I share my screen? Uh, yes. Are you able to screen share? No, it's disabled. Oh, I've made you co-host now, Brandy. Oh, oh, I just okay. just quickly. Oh, and there oh, should yeah, be. Yeah, I can. I can. Yeah. Oh, and there should be a button you can click that enables it yeah. for everyone. Oh, I'll try to find that. Thanks. Okay, this is really half-assed slideshow pulled together. Can everyone see that? Yep, I can. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the three R's and the Climate Rescue Accord, and that's uh website there, climaterescue.net. So the Climate Rescue Accord started as a conversation between on climate policy between representatives from different registered political parties and uh, a, a working group formed and parties signed on and that those were parties represented in the working group, including Fusion, Animal Justice Party, Oz Progressives and Reason. Unfortunately, Reason has disbanded now. Um, we've got some others coming on board. Um, and then on the working group, we also have someone from Vote Climate One, which is a traffic light voting card, and the Climate Emergency Declaration. And we're, what the Accord is driving is advocacy and education on the three R's of climate rescue, reduce, remove, reflect, and a platform. It's also a platform for minor parties and independents to adopt to help win minority government. Um, so you might recognise this as Australia's appalling climate target, net zero by 2050. Um, warming is speeding up. So James Hansen has just noted that warming is speeding up 10 times faster than at any other time in the planet's history. Um, there are radical, uh, you, you might have seen some really alarming charts about surface, ocean surface temperature, land surface temperature, and how just month on month these are breaking records, just way above anything we've seen. Climate scientists call it gobsmacking. Um, so what, well, let's just start with is zero enough to zero emissions enough to present catastrophic heating, let alone net zero. 
Um, Michael Mann from the Embedded in IPCC Orthodoxy will say, yes, it is. Jim Hansen, um, who is, you know, first introduced global warming to US Congress back in 88, um, has a different view. So um, Michael Mann says, yes, net zero by 2050 is enough to stop catastrophic heating. Whereas Jim Hansen says, no, it's not. We also need to remove excess greenhouse gas emissions and make Earth more reflective. Um, and I think that Michael Mann will be coming around to that position given the changes we've seen over the last two months. Can't speak for him, though. Another uh, really inconvenient factor is that we're, by burning fossil fuels, we're already causing cooling because aerosols reflect sunlight. So while we're, you know, we measure about a 1.5 degree of heating from the from the gases warming gases we are also creating either at the low end 0.4 degrees of cooling from the the sunlight that's reflected up to one and a half degrees of cooling so that's a huge amount of cooling that we're creating when we stop burning fossil fuels that disappears really quickly and we've got to do something about that, but it's not really talked about much. That's just, These are just some of the charts you might have seen recently about surface temperature going up. So something radical is required to turn around this accelerated heating. We need to stop heating and we need to reverse it. But unfortunately, we don't really get that from uh, the climate policy out there. No one's really talking about stopping and reversing heating. They're just talking about climate action. Um, the three R's of climate rescue are we go to zero, we remove excess greenhouse gases, and then we're still, if we look at that red dotted line, that above that is the danger zone. If we want to get back below the danger zone, we've got to do something else but besides the zero emissions and the drawdown. We've got to actively call. We've got to increase the reflectivity of the planet. There's different ways to do that. Um, what, what the accord says are, are agreed upon terms for reduce is stop fossil fuel expansion, phase out fossil fuel use and prevent methane release. Remove, there's lots of things we can do. There's lots of R&D we can do. And then for increasing um, active cooling or solar radiation management, um, you know, you can do it down at ground level, you can do it at cloud level, you can do it in the, in the up in the stratosphere or you can do it in space. A lot of them require a lot of R&D um, to, to look at the best options. But, you know, we've just, we really, we're so out of time. Um, and so anyway, forget, but scrub that slide. Um, that's it. Fantastic. Uh, and in under time. Uh, so that's, uh, that's Bryony, everyone. Uh, You've got, if anyone would like to ask a question, uh, we've allowed about three minutes for questions now. Miles. There's, so um, you, ad, you advocate quite strongly there for a, um, at least one method of geoengineering. And obviously there are a few proposals on the table, but there are, um, there are potentially significant risks with those. Uh, so um, do you want to, can you, can you take 30 seconds to talk a little bit more about those other proposals and what the sure. risks are? Sure, yeah. So stratospheric aerosols is what we usually hear about, and that's because it's really cheap to do. But, um, you know, the, the risks are that it just gives fossil fuels a green, a licence to keep burning, whereas we don't want them to keep burning. This is the three R's are a whole package. It's not one or the other, it's all of them. And um, if you do reflect you've also got to do reduce and remove um if we don't start advocating on this someone's just going to do it anyway they're going to do put it put aerosols up there um so we need to start advocating about the whole package if you if you're doing ground level ones you know the risks really aren't there you you know you're, you're lightening roofs and roads this is a huge part of la's uh, climate plan that you know to reducing local temperatures by about two degrees. Um, people have costed mirrors on the ground, they've costed mirrors in space or space shades. Um, if we go the stratospheric aerosol one, you you know, that can cause acid rain because these, are, you, but you can do different things that aren't going to cause 
acid rain. It's not just aerosols you would use. Um, and also you could it could change rainfall patterns. So does that answer you, Miles, or are you thinking of something else? No, no, that 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 pretty much that's pretty comprehensive compared to mm -hmm. what 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 I'm aware of. Right. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, we will have to move on now. <laughs> um, and so I, uh, Yuki put uh, their hand up before, so I'd like to invite Yuki to do her speech next. Yeah. Hello. My name is Yuki. Yes. Uh, I'm going to be talking about AI risk and what AI risk is, the four main risks as I see them, why AI is kind of a unique problem, why it's kind of separate from other global problems such as climate change or nuclear war, let's say, and lastly, what we can do about it. So some of the main risks are things like misinformation. You've probably all heard of uh, deep fakes, whether that's fabricated audio or video. Uh, just recently, a professor was, a false accusation was made against him using fake audio. And I think it took like two months for the police to discover that it was fabricated. And as these systems become more sophisticated, it's going to become harder for humans to detect, maybe even impossible for humans. And we're going to have to rely on AI. And we don't know how that offense defense is going to play out in terms of detection and, and fabrication. Uh, another problem is uh, actually bio risk. AI has actually shown that it's quite capable of solving various problems like the protein folding problem, where it can predict how an amino sequence will fold. This was something really hard for humans, but the AI was able to figure it out. And with the availability and in the future, even greater ability of bioprinters, it's not totally inconceivable that there could just be novel pathogens and viruses floating around out there. And again, here it seems like the offense side of creating these pathogens would be stronger. You know, even if the good AIs, quote unquote, were developing vaccines, that wouldn't be fast enough. Um, another risk is joblessness, of course. Uh, there's I mean, nothing much really needs to be said here. A lot of jobs are already at risk of being automated, a lot of white collar jobs. And it doesn't look like society is really ready to, to deal with that. And lastly, AI is actually a risk in itself. The, what we're trying to, what humanity collectively, well, what these AI labs are trying to create isn't chatbots or uh, text predictors or image generators, their, their express goal is to create a general intelligence, uh, an intelligence that can do all human tasks better than humans, and perhaps even super intelligence. So it could be more intelligent than us in the way that we're more intelligent than, say, chimpanzees. And if the super intelligence isn't aligned with our goals or values, we would lose. We would be disempowered in the same way that chimpanzees are disempowered today. And so those are kind of the, that's the bad side of things. But why I think AI is different from these other problems is that let's say, you know, humanity works really hard and they're able to solve climate change. I don't know how I'm doing for time actually, I'm all right. But let's say humanity somehow solves climate change. Even if that, even if they succeeded, there would be all these other problems. There would be nuclear war, there would be AI, there would be bio-risk. Whereas if humanity actually manages to solve alignment, to solve the problem of aligning a superintelligence with human values, then this superintelligence could solve all these other problems for us. Like climate change ultimately is a technical problem. It might be able to find a solution that we, we never even thought of. Um, it can, it's not inconceivable that it would easily be able to achieve something like UBI for everybody. We could really be living in the end of history for real this time, uh, you know, untold prosperity. And so we really need to get this right. And so how can we do that? There's, as individuals, a lot of what you could do is, is spreading awareness 
and getting the government to institute in Australia an AI safety safety institute that's able to evaluate these models uh, and assess risks and invest more time and money into really figuring out what the big problems are and how to fix them. Yeah, that's probably it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Yuki. Uh, do you want to give a, because you skipped it, give you a brief introduction of who you are as well? Um, my name is Yuki. I'm an um, immigrant here from Japan. All right. Um, uh, yeah. well, are you a member of the party, Yuki? Uh, I'm not a member of any party. Maybe I should be, though. Oh, and you can't just ask that. That's rude. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> There's probably like half the people here aren't members of the party. Oh, no, it's just out of curiosity. <laughs> I, I didn't hear about this party until Miles sent me an invite. Well, there you go. Uh, we, have, we have time for one one question if someone has one. Uh, oh, I yeah. just just curious, Yuki. Um, what do you think of the idea of um, let's say we go ahead with an AI safety institute as proposed? Um, what what about the risk that the safety institute ends up sort of toothless, powerless? Yeah, that's a that's definitely a big risk. Um, there's there's a very big chance that the Australian Safety Institute itself won't be able to do very much, but because globally all the countries are getting getting on board making their own safety institutes there's this hope that collectively they will be able to take action in a way that isn't toothless fingers crossed yep. fantastic all right moving right along because we will run out of time otherwise uh, i would like to invite uh, owen to introduce himself uh, and give his section next hey um hi everyone um, so yeah, uh, my name's Owen Miller. I'm a software engineer. I studied robotics and computer science. Um, I'm currently the convener for Fusion. I've run as a candidate. Um, so yeah, let's dive right in. Uh, how is bad software undermining our society? So when we think of software undermining our society, uh, most people would think of you know killer AIs actively killing us, or perhaps what was prophesized with the Y2K bug, the idea of the electricity grid going offline and planes falling out of the sky. What often gets ignored, though, is the rampant spread of suboptimal software, which, although less dramatic, it still manages to hold back society, and it still manages to bring down companies or industries along the way. Let's start with a recent example. A child had a swollen penis, and the parents contacted their doctor about it. Uh, they were instructed to send a photo. When the father took the photo, it was automatically synced with, uh, with Google, Google scanned it and then uh, reported the father to police, accusing him of molesting his son. Now, the child made a full recovery, but the father remains locked out of all his Google accounts, his personal email, his business email, his calendar, uh, Google Fi, his mobile service, even the Google Authenticator app, so he can't even log into non-Google accounts. Now, despite all these sorts of problems that happen with Google software, you know, Google remains strong. It has various monopolies people feel they're locked in. But for companies that can't survive as easily with their buggy software, we can look to the Internet of Things, or as some call it, the Internet of Shit. The Internet of Things has become <laughs> abundant with uh, buggy software, especially security bugs. Um, take, for instance, the first Bluetooth hair straightener, um, which was revealed to be hackable, so you could remotely start a fire. Uh, or the repeated hacks of the various smart door locks. Um, this industry, it was once built as the fourth industrial revolution, and indeed it could have been. People have long hoped for an interconnected cybernetic society as a way of improving efficiency and creating harmony. If we look to crypto as well, another industry praised with lofty predictions that have unfortunately failed to materialize. Smart contracts, zero-knowledge proofs, we could have created a trustless society where, just like a vending machine, it's mechanically guaranteed that the contract will be followed. Instead, we're left to depend on governments to ensure that contracts are followed. The government has to impose its monopoly on violence to implement law and order in a way that's slow, expensive, and very hit and miss. So who should get involved with software to make it right? Should governments get involved? Is it just an issue for consumers to sort out themselves? Is it even a big deal? Well, things have gotten so bad that we 
killed off the fourth industrial revolution, if things are at this scale, then surely we can already call it a market failure, can't we? And look at what's ahead. As we just saw, as AI becomes even more capable, when you look at these toasters and these shit coins, what sort of quality can you really expect from AI? A clue to the solution here, though, is how we might define killer AIs. There's a popular example of the paperclip maximizer, which destroys the earth so it can keep making more paperclips. But look at what we already have. We have soulless companies and governments whose pursuit of GDP growth is actively killing life on our planet. So here's my claim. We have bad software because primarily software, the software being made is software that serves GDP maximization. We've seen software that's not made for GDP maximization. Um, the open source community has produced um, Linux, for instance. It's produced some of the most widespread programs in our society. Furthermore, the organizations responsible for creating this GDP software, they tend to grow large. So it encourages laziness and satisficing. Startups come along once in a while and improve things. When Instagram was purchased by Facebook, for instance, for $1 billion, it only had 13 employees at the time. So in order to get good software, we need the engineers to be in small organizations or they need to be personally invested in the outcome. Imagine if you could work on an open source security library and actually update the software within your smart door lock. Imagine if you actually had the right to repair the internet connected bricks that you purchased. Um, so the government has a duty here to get involved in this space because it's, the software world is a public commons and because our digital world is such a huge part of society, which we would like to be democratic. We've got glimpses of what a cybernetic society looks like. In Chile in 1971, they started Project Cybersyn. And now in Estonia, uh, government processes have all become digitalized. Um, and so now in Estonia, they're only paying a flat 20% income tax rate. They have higher happiness ratings than Italy and Spain, and they're ranked as the best place in Europe for doing business. So to achieve this goal in Australia, firstly, all government software should be open source so we can improve it. Then secondly, the government should implement a universal basic income so motivated people can have the freedom to create software which benefits humanity they're not dependent on a paycheck from a foreign tech giant. And, you know, people outside the software industry, they have a hard time seeing what we're missing out on. But the results from Estonia, they really speak for themselves. We can dream so much bigger of what's possible for Australia. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Aaron. That was, you finished literally as the alarm went off. A few. <laughs> uh, we have time for one question. Anyone? Yeah, I've got a quick question. Uh, this has to do with AI and open sourcing. Hmm. So you mentioned that all software should be uh, open source. Um, what if, uh, as we approach AGI, uh, general intelligence, do you think that then the risks of, a, of it being used by a bad actor is high enough that open sourcing it would be a bad idea? Uh, yeah, this is an argument I've heard before. And I guess, you know, when you speak about the diseases, um, that, that that's the go-to example. Um, I would actually direct everybody to, um, we just one month ago, we made a submission. The Senate was holding an inquiry on what to do about AI in Australia. Um, I was the main person writing that submission. Uh, it's on our website, yeah. And um, basically, I do indeed uh, advocate for openness. Um, I say that we have to race against the bad actors that we're never going to be able to keep the cat in the bag. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Tyrone Delisle. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, can you see my uh, presentation? Yeah, all good. Just uh, briefly okay. introduce yourself. Uh, Brief introduction for myself. Uh, I'm Tyrone Delisle. I've worked, I've been an environmental campaigner for over a decade. I currently work for the international uh, environmental organization called We Planet. You can see it there. Um, I'm a co founder of the Australian chapter, um, We Planet Australia, of which Andrea Leong is the current president. Um, Okay, I'm just going to launch into my presentation. Um, I've got a lot to cover, so it will be very quick. So uh, I apologize, but there might be time for a question afterwards. 
Okay. Um, so I'm giving a brief overview of the six key reasons Australia should overturn the ban on nuclear. But before I go into these reasons, I want to give some quick context for why we need to be having this discussion. As I'm sure most of you are aware, we're facing a climate crisis, which is driven by human activity, primarily the burning of fossil fuels and the destruction of ecosystems such as forests. The current climate science, clients, climate science indicates that we're almost guaranteed to hit two degrees of warming. How much we exceed that is based on decisions that we make today. Energy is life. The climate challenge is how we ensure access to energy without contributing to the climate crisis. The story of the past century has been of people rising out of poverty by gaining access to more energy. This explains why, despite investments in clean energy, fossil fuels still account for over 80% of all energy use today. So reason number one for overturning the ban. It's outdated and it lacks social license. Very briefly, the ban was introduced in 1998 as part of a deal between the Howard government and the Greens and Democrats in exchange for them supporting the building of the new Opal Research Reactor at Lucas Heights. The Howard government um, allowed leg a legislative ban on nuclear power plants and other nuclear facilities. This was at a time where the true extent of the climate crisis wasn't fully known. But as mentioned before, Times have changed and we now know the challenge we face. Maintaining the ban under this new knowledge is morally unjustifiable, and I'll explain why through the other points. Some opposed to nuclear say that nuclear has no social license in this country, but really it's the ban that has no social license, as polling over recent years consistently shows greater support for nuclear than those that oppose. Reason number two, the energy transition is complex and uncertain. Evidence shows that most efficient way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from energy use is to electrify everything. What does this mean? Well, it means electrifying our transport, chemical industry, food production, and more. There's a lot of uncertainty about exactly how much additional demand for electricity that will create between now and 2050. There are competing ideas about what technology and pathways will follow, Remember, these are, aren't just engineering challenges, but social challenges that will, that um, what will people accept or choose and how quickly? The other issue is variability. It's true we've used renewable sources like hydro for a long time, but running entire countries on primarily viable source, variable sources like wind and solar is yet to be demonstrated. This doesn't mean it can't technically be done, but is potentially risky to bet our future on an unproven concept. This takes me to the next reason. Reason number three, nuclear is, proven so is a proven source of clean, reliable energy. Life cycle analysis looks at everything from the extraction of resources to the electricity generation, decommissioning, waste management, and even accidents. A number of life cycle studies show that nuclear energy has similar or lower environmental impacts than wind and solar. That ticks the clean energy requirement that I mentioned earlier. It's ultra reliable, providing clean energy around the clock, regardless of weather, except for the most extreme storms. In fact, the record for the most continuous days of operation for a nuclear reactor was 1,106 days achieved by a CANDU reactor in Canada. If you look at the graph there from our world and data, you'll also see that nuclear is right in the middle of wind and solar in terms of emissions and safety. Reason number four, nuclear has a very small land use footprint. It's true, Australia is a big landmass, but it's not empty. There are human activities, there's cultural value, and of course, important biodiversity. The more land we use for energy, the greater the chance it will conflict with other land uses such as farming, cultural landscapes, and biodiversity conservation. This conflict can quickly erode the social license for energy projects and we're starting to see that already with large wind and solar projects. Mm -hmm. Nuclear's small land use footprint means less chance of these land use conflicts. And of course, it means we can spare more land for nature. This isn't just to maintain the beauty of the natural world, but also the vital ecosystem services. I'll skip over reason number five because I'm running out of time, but it was jobs. 
Reason number six, lifting the ban doesn't mean we simply have to build we have to build nuclear. It simply gives Australia more options to managing and achieving the ambitious goal of reaching net zero and net negative, as Bryony mentioned. It also sends the right message to the public and international partners that the Australian government accepts science and rejects anti-science dogma. Crucially, it, remove, it removes a wedge from the long and damaging energy culture wars that have plagued our um, country for the past two decades. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, if you're very quick, we can have a question from Owen. Um, hey, Tyrone, what do you think of the odds that uh, the Greens issue a formal apology for uh, blocking nuclear? Uh, I think it's pretty low. <laughs> um, but as I said, it was made at a time that was different to today. I think we just need to focus on the challenges today and getting the ban lifted so that we can address the, the net zero task. Thank you. All right. Can you stop sharing, uh, Tyrone? Uh, if I can work out how to do that. Pause share. Stop share. Um, and uh, next up, we have Angus. Uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself briefly, and then <laughs> I will uh, get your slides up. All right. I'll do the quick and brief introduction while slides come along. Hello, I'm Angus Lemon Palmer. I'm a casual hospital worker, a fusion volunteer, and also the comms committee chair for them. I'll be highlighting the presence of cannabis does not necessarily correlate to impairment and we'll dive into drug driving reform that is fair, equal and improved public health. In 2016, Australia legalised access to medical cannabis. I'm a prescribed medical cannabis patient, which also doesn't just affect me, but other people I know. <clears throat> the problem if you take cannabis medicine that contains THC as prescribed, you cannot legally drive. 350K, the approximate number of active legal medical cannabis patients in Australia. That number only continues to grow, same with our medical cannabis industry. 70%, the number of medical cannabis patients like myself that have some THC in their medication and therefore cannot drive legally. 600,000, the approximate number of roadside tests for cannabis each year in Australia. <clears throat> the impact. Safety. There's no evidence that suggests roadside testing has made Australian roads safer. Discrimination. Cannabis is the only legally prescribed medication for which you lose your licence when testing positive for presence, not impairment. Health. Current laws deter patients from medical cannabis and heightens anxiety for those who drive. Current drug driving laws fail to improve road safety, discriminate against medical cannabis patients and impede public health outcomes. Let me be clear. I want our roads to be safe. Any driver who is impaired is a safety risk to themselves and others. The truth is impairment from medical cannabis cannot be tested from a mouth swab. Research shows that the effects of cannabis last as low as, an up, last as, low as two and up to eight hours from consumption, but it can still be detected and tests up to a week later, far beyond the time of impairment. Our laws avoid the truth that impairment can come from an excess or misuse of many legal drugs. This includes other medicines like opiates, benzodiazepines, amphetamines, and alcohol. Research shows that cannabis has a lower crash risk than, crash risk than benzos and opiates. Australian patients who test positive for the presence of these are potentially impairing drugs who can provide evidence of prescription are free to drive because they have a legal medical defense. It should be no different for cannabis patients. We can keep our roads safe by relying on scientific evidence, not outdated laws. Australia is the only country with a widespread random mobile drug test program for detection of THC. In Canada, oral fluids tests such as those used in Australia can be used to confirm a suspected case of drug-impaired driving, but only when an officer can first demonstrate impaired driving. If found to have cannabis presence in your oral fluid as the driver WA, the first offence is 1,250 max and three demerits lost. Second and subsequent offences are $2,000 max and six months disqualification minimum. That way, police will issue drivers who test positive for cannabis or refuse a roadside drug test with a 24-hour driving ban. The solution, 
equal rights for legal medical cannabis patients. The government implements Australia-wide uniform drug driving laws to allow for a complete defence to the presence of THC in a driver's oral fluid or blood when the driver has a valid doctor's prescription for a medicine containing THC. The offence does not involve dangerous or reckless driving and an officer cannot establish driver impairment. Victoria has a new trial to begin in September. It seeks to test just how impaired people with medical cannabis in the system are whilst driving. About 70 participants <clears throat> will take part in the trial. Results are due in 2026. In Tasmania, it is legal to drive as long as a person is not impaired by the drug. <clears throat> Dr. Alex Werdock, AM. He is a physician and the former director of the Alcohol and Drug Service at St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney, Australia. His quote, penalties for roadside drug testing for cannabis are far more severe than for drivers with a positive brand and breath test for alcohol. Also, a driving license is a very severe penalty for those with serious health problems who require frequent medical care and people living in rural areas. <clears throat> I'm a supporter of the Cannabis Law Reform Alliance and a campaign drive change for their values, truth, respect, growth and transparency, which Fiona Patton is an ambassador. <clears throat> Thank you for coming to the Fusion Lightning Talks and listening to my presentation. I'm now free to open some... <clears throat> questions All right we do have time for a potentially two questions uh miles if you'd like to go first i heard a rumor that you might be uh running for government in west australia what's your platform gonna be and why should people vote for you <laughs> um i have a fair few things that i'm interested about so yes i'm a potential candidate and interested in putting my hand forward so that's um I'll cover various topics such as like the cost of living crisis, like our wages and housing and stuff like that. Um, I'm all for nuclear power as well because of the data and evidence and been following it for years. Uh, there's vaping, which I'm, well, I use to help quit smoking myself. And there's so much misinformation and stuff like that about there. Um, oh, there's so much more, but that's pretty much just the top of my head at the moment. All right. Uh, was there another question or shall we carry on? All right. Um, next up, we actually haven't had someone claim a slot yet. If someone would like to volunteer to go next. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah, no. oh, we'll put you next after that, John. Andrea, then John. Uh, we can't hear you at moment, Andrea. How about now? There we go. There we go. All right. And then this is probably the window that I want to share. Can you see that? Yep. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks um, for the introduction. My name's Andrea Leong. I'm a microbiologist. Some of you might know me from Fusion and also the Science Party before that. And I'm the president of We Planet Australia. Now, I'm going to talk about cellular agriculture. And I chose this photo uh, for my background of these slides because the foods that I'm going to talk about are not produced in a lab. They're produced in a factory with the same standards as any other packaged or processed food. Um, it's actually pretty normal. Now, cellular agriculture, what is it? It's the technology that uses single cells instead of animals to produce food. And I'll come back to how this is done. But to look at the future of food, we first need to look at food today. Did that change the slide? It didn't for me. No. Nope. Okay, here we are. Thank you. Uh, this chart is from Our World in Data. Over the last 60 years, global meat production has increased by five times. During that time, world population did grow, but only by two and a half times. This means that we're now eating twice as much meat per person as we did 60 years ago. Demand for meat grows as people get richer. Turns out people like eating meat and Australians are among the world's top meat consumers. Here we are 
uh, third in the world, taking out the bronze medal at more than twice the global average for meat eating. If everyone ate like Australians, the world would need to produce more than double the meat that we produce today. But we don't have space to do that. Here's how much land we already use for animal farming. And we've cleared nearly half of the world's vegetation on uh, all of the habitable land of the world. We've cleared nearly half the world's vegetation for industrial use. If we were to double meat production using current farming methods, we would be cutting down most of the world's remaining forests. And forests are carbon sinks that we can't afford to get rid of. Deforestation leads to desertification and loss of species. Now we can avoid cutting down forests if we cram animals together in feedlots, but that is bad for their welfare, obviously, and it promotes disease, including bird flu and swine flu. We just don't have enough planet to keep doing things the same way. This is why we need technologies, including cellular agriculture. Cellular agriculture is a subset of alternative proteins and I think alternative proteins is not a great name because they're all perfectly normal proteins. Plant proteins, on the one hand, this subset of alternative proteins on the left, plant-based alternatives from plant proteins have been processed for thousands of years. And now, recently, plant proteins are being carefully processed to mimic meat. These products that you can get in the supermarket make it easy for someone who eats an average Australian diet to do Meatless Monday without having to learn new recipes or change their traditions. It's culturally relevant, and that is a perfectly reasonable thing to want from our food. So plant proteins are cool, but maybe we can do things smarter. Can we properly industrialise protein production, take it from the field into the factory and remove some of the risk associated with growing crops in a changing climate. Early cellular agriculture includes corn, which uses fungal proteins similar to mushrooms grown in bulk. And now we're moving into the era where we can do this sort of cellular agriculture, which is to say um, growing meat from a small sample of animal cells or genetically programming bacteria and yeast to produce milk or egg proteins. And this is done in large fats. And these pro products are becoming available on the market. And people who have tried them say that they are indistinguishable from animal meat and animal dairy. So what the cellular agriculture industry needs right now is a big investment to make it viable at scale including investment from government so it can compete with the established and subsidised animal agriculture industry. Australia is incredibly well positioned to do this with its long history of excellence in both farming and biotechnology. Will these products take off with consumers? That's the most important thing. Will anyone buy them? Well, cell cultivated meat is reasonably well accepted and it's not even uh, widely available yet. About one in four Australians say that they would eat it, and that's enough to support an industry. But we do need to keep hyping it up to maintain the support and make sure it happens. We Planet Australia made a submission to Food Standards Australia New Zealand, the Trans-Tasman Food Regulator, regarding cultured quail meat, which should hopefully soon be the first of many cultured uh, meat products and other cellular agriculture products available in Australia. There is a risk that cellular agriculture will fall into the realm of the culture wars, which energy is kind of um, where it's at at the moment, um, as you heard in Tyrone's talk, um, which, sorry, <laughs> Tyrone didn't actually talk about energy being in the realm of the culture wars, but um, uh, Tyrone spoke about nuclear energy, which is definitely in the realm of the culture wars. Um, and there's a risk of cellular agriculture falling into that category too. It's happening in some European countries and US states, which have banned or are looking to ban cell cultured meat. Um, if it sometimes feels like a hard slog hyping up this new industry uh, before you've even had a taste of these products, just uh, remember that we're doing it for the animals and we are doing it for this. Thank you. 
Thank you, Andrea. I was about to have to <laughs> stop you there. Um, if your question is very quick, uh, I'll let you get through it, Owen. Um, yeah, Andrea, just wondering, you mentioned um, about the subsidies for farmers worldwide, and I guess um, it, it seems as though there's inevitably going to be um, an argument that, you know, you're you're taking farmers' jobs, and, you know, farmers are so noble, it's, um, you know, a profession that should be praised, and, you know, are you undermining farmers? Um, I, I don't know, like, how much has that debate already happened, and what would be your response that you're stealing farmers' jobs? It's going to be a gradual transition because we've got that demand for meat increasing and it will be a supplementation in the first instance. So the animal farming will continue for a long time while uh, the cellular agriculture industry ramps up to take care of the uh, growing demand. So there is plenty of time for governments to uh, put a long lead time on any changes in policy. And it just, it's one of those things that has to be done because of the deforestation that happens with animal agriculture and it's a hard to decarbonize industry. This is just something that needs leadership from governments here to say, we are going to transition over the next few decades. Thank you. All right, if you'd like to stop sharing, uh, John, we'll have you up next uh, with a quick introduction and then off you go. Oh dear. Okay, uh, good good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Yes, I'm John August. I'm involved with the Pirate Party, uh, currently treasurer, have been a different office bearer at times past. I've stood for election multiple times. I've been on community radio. If you're in Sydney, I do Speaker's Corner in the domain in front of the art gallery on the third Sunday of the month, sort of if I'm around and weather permitting. Um, but yes, I've been very interested in science, intellectual property, um, a lot of issues, but for the moment, you know, things around foreign policy have condensed a bit. So I guess, um, so I'll, I'll start now, I suppose. So I'm going to talk in a meandering sort of way on foreign policy. Now it's meandering, but equally there's a lot going on with foreign policy. Now let's start with Australia. While you might think we're principled, look after each other, and are good to our neighbours, foreign policy tells a very different story. We've done the dirty on Timor-Leste, spying on them with the ongoing debacle around Witness K and Bernard Kaleri. While we owe East Timor from World War II, we take the US debt a lot more seriously. Go back far enough, you had the Indian, Indonesian mass killings. And if you've seen the movie, The Act of Killing, that sort of bears on that. Now, foreign policy is one of the last vestiges of royal prerogative where our government has licensed to be an arsehole, to behave like a bully behind closed doors, while in public it's selling Australian values. It comes mostly from vested financial interests, as with resources and Timor-Leste, or focusing on supposed economic gains at the expense of everything else, or we're kowtowing to the US. Now, to be fair, there's a little bit of principal foreign policy in the mix as well, but it really is quite small. Now, there's lots of injustice in the world, but we focus on particular nations for reasons separate to the actual injustice. And we even have selective humanitarian intervention. It might be vested financial interests or it might be cozying up to the US. Now, I appreciate that a big current issue is the Israel-Gaza conflict. I'll observe that, you, that the ICC made a case against both Israel and Hamas, and that you can criticize Israel without being anti-Semitic. But there's a bigger story here, and I don't want to get drawn into that rabbit hole, uh, just briefly mentioning it so that at least I'm not ignoring it. Now, while the US wants a rules-based order, the US has long thumbed its nose at the International Criminal Court. The US wants a rules-based order, but only if they're the ones making the rules. The WikiLeaks cables actually describe how the US subverts international trade and it leans on international intellectual property laws, amongst other things, to support its own corporations. Then there's Julian Assange. We've long supported Mr. Assange, a whistleblower who's been targeted by the US. Um, but our government will certainly support Australians in trouble overseas when it's politically convenient and it doesn't actually annoy our allies. Our past foreign minister claimed Mr. Assange would be subject to due process in UK courts. 
ignoring that it was due process in the application of unjust laws. And our current government has been dragging its heels because I guess it's just too uncomfortable and awkward. Then there's China. Now, during the Hong Kong crisis, John Howard described the Hong Kong demonstrators as inspirational, forgetting that when half a million Australians took part in demonstrations against his involvement in the Iraq war, he said they were giving comfort to Saddam Hussein. In reply, the opposition said he was questioning the loyalty of Australian citizens. Now, China's worth criticising how they've dealt with Hong Kong and the Uyghurs, but that's different to them being a military threat. Supposedly challenging China means you're automatically pro-US and vice versa. But I think that we can all actually think about more than one thing at a time. The US has been projecting soft power into Australia, infiltrating our institutions, and China's done that as well. But in, par in comparison, they've been, well, the bull in the uh, China shop. But anyway, I'll move on from there. China's endured colonial bullying during the century of humiliation, and Chinese philosophy is quite impressive. But as China's power has grown, it started to do what everybody else with power has done, flex its muscles, abuse logic, try to prove falsehoods by strong assertion and blame foreign provocateurs when people have good reason to protest. While there's a point in scrutinising China, Australia's approach was mostly the result of being goaded by the US rather than having our own position. Remember how the US goaded our previous government into suggesting a review into the origins of COVID. Now, speaking of Saddam Hussein, while we originally refused refugees, half a year later we invaded. Iraq had suddenly changed so much. While Howard wanted UN inspectors looking into Hussein's palaces, he didn't want UN inspectors looking into his own refugee camps, the ones we had in Australia. Saddam's was certainly a vicious regime, but we can wonder whether it actually improved the situation for Iraqis, blundering in, whether blundering in was the best thing to do. Not to mention the weapons of mass destruction that we found. Well, no, we didn't, did we? More often concerned about human rights is a justification, not the reason. But in closing, foreign policy is a way of being an arsehole, of abusing the truth, of flexing your muscles, all while beating your chest to claim credibility. That's true regardless, be it China or the US or Australia. In criticising China, it does, this does not mean that we thereby endorse the US or even our own foreign policy nor should we deny our own hypocrisies. Surely we can escape black and white thinking. Thank you. All right, thank you, John. Um, uh, what we will do is we will allow people to hang around and ask questions uh, for anyone who's free to stay at the end of this, just as I'm aware, time is proceeding. Uh, if anyone has a very fast question for John, we can squeeze one in, otherwise we'll go forward. Nope. All right. Uh, thank you very much, John. Uh, Sundance, uh, yeah. I believe you are up next. Cool. Let me just uh, share my screen. This works okay. No. Okay. Can everyone can everyone hear me and see something? We can hear you and we can see a thing. A white screen, which is hopefully going to come up in a second. Okay, all right. Okay. So good. All right. So, so by way of introduction, um, I'm a researcher and lecturer in the physics department at the University of Adelaide. I'm also the president of an advocacy organisation called Freestyle Cyclists, and I have previously stood in 2016 as a Senate candidate for the Australian Cyclists Party um, on a sort of joint ticket with the Science Party. So, I want to talk about transport cycling. Uh, which is a immediately implementable low-tech solution to a lot of environmental and social problems. Unfortunately, cycling in Australia has been in decline since 2011. Um, if you look at the number of people who have cycled in the last week, month or year, it's been going pretty much steadily downhill except during lockdowns, uh, which is a great shame because the potential for cycling is huge. About 26% of commuter journeys in Australia are just the right sort of distance to ride a bike. Um, and we really would like to see more people riding bikes as a replacement for car travel because cars are pretty much awful. They have a whole slew of problems associated with them, um, including sedentary lifestyles, space taken up for roads and parking and, and whatnot. And those problems are associated with electric cars as well as petrol cars. On the other hand, bicycles make massive, riding a bicycle regularly has massive improvements to your health, 
uh, your immune system function, reductions in all-cause mortality and cardiovascular disease mortality, redu reductions in depression, people who do their shopping by bicycle spend more than people who do their shopping by car. There was a federal government study from 2013 which basically found that everyone who cycles to work saves the economy about $5,000 per year. Um, and switching from a petrol car to a, to a bicycle cuts your CO2 emissions by 10 times more than switching to an EV because of the amount of energy that's required to manufacture a, a, an electric car. So what does this have to do with helmet laws? Well, lots of things can discourage people from cycling. In Australia, we have, we're have we almost unique in having laws that require everyone to wear a helmet under all circumstances when they cycle. If you look at the diagrams here, I've plotted out the states and territories in order of increasing enforcement of helmet laws. Um, and we see that as enforcement goes up, cycling participation goes down, uh, especially in female cyclists. Also, if we rank the states and territories in order of, of enforcement, we see that rather than cycling fatalities decreasing, cycling fatalities actually kind of level off or even go up. So somehow helmet laws don't seem to be doing what they say on the tin in terms of making cycling safer. If we compare cycling injuries and other transport injuries over time, we see that all transport modes got safer at around about the same time that helmet laws were brought in. So we can't ascribe those improvements just to helmet laws. So what's going on here? Well, we have studies of hospitalized cyclists which suggest that helmet use reduces head injury rates by 30 to 70 percent but anyone who's familiar with the concept of conditional probability will recognize that here we have a case of selection bias when you look at people who are brought in after having an accident you're just looking at the rate of accidents per uh, sorry, injuries per accident you're not looking at the rate of injuries per overall journey if you have circumstances when accidents are very rare then helmet use achieves very little. And we can do calculations based on uh, measures of cycling participation and find that in reality, the probability of, suffering, probability of suffering a serious head injury per journey is about one in three million. And the probability of a fatality per journey is about one in 15 million. Um, and so therefore the, the reduction in injury rate per journey from, from helmet use is very, very small. Also, we need to recognize that there's a bias towards the cyclists who are engaging in sports cycling being brought in for accidents. So we can't necessarily apply those uh, results and extrapolate them across to transport cycling where you have more risk averse cyclists who tend not to have accidents. So all, all helmet laws seem to have done is reduce the number of people who are riding who weren't really having very many accidents in the first place. There's also a social harm aspect to this. Um, psychological studies have shown that motorists tend to view cyclists in helmets and also high-vis clothing as less than fully human and are more likely to engage in aggressive behaviour towards them. In Seattle, it was found that people of colour and homeless people were vastly more likely to be targeted by the police for ticketing for helmet infringements. Uh, we have research from New South Wales, which suggests that the same thing is going on in New South Wales, including young people with uh, mental illnesses and disabilities who are accumulating tens of thousands of dollars of fine debt that they can't pay, which brings them into the legal system for a minor offence. In South Australia, something similar seems to be going on where court enforcement of helmet infringements is about 10 times higher than court enforcement of speeding fines and is focused on rural areas with significant Indigenous populations. So, in short, um, cycling is an inherently safe activity that's really good for society and it's vastly safer than a lot of other activities people do that are considered perfectly acceptable. Um, it's something that we can do straight away. We, we need to make a transition to electric vehicles in the transport sector, but that'll take years or decades and we can do a transition to bikes right now and solve a whole bunch of social problems at the same time and empower people who cannot drive for various reasons, either economic or disability related or, or so on. Um, by having laws which punish people for doing something which has a, is a victimless crime, we're missing out on all those economic, social and environmental benefits. Uh, we turn a, a beneficial activity into a, into a crime. We create a crime which is easily used by police to target already disadvantaged groups. And we slow down the transition to a fossil fuel free uh, form of transport by creating the impression that an activity which is really incredibly safe is more dangerous than it truly is. And here are my references. Thank you. Thank you. Um, run a little bit over time with that one. Sorry about that. Stop sharing. Are you desperate for your question, Miles? No. Okay.
Uh, in that case, thank you very much. Um, and we will move on to Miles, who is actually our next speaker. Uh, when you stop sharing. Um, yeah, for some reason, my screen's not bringing up the stop sharing option. Ah. Mine was in a sort of bar hovering at the top of the screen. Yeah, it is. It was, it was hidden off to the side of the screen. I had to slide it out. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so if anyone wants to uh, follow along at home, I'll put a link to my slides in chat. Uh, my name is Miles. I am a polymath, which means I do a bit of everything. I don't do anything particularly well, but some things I do a lot more than others. Uh, some of those things include philosophy, politics, uh, physics as well, mm -hmm. um, teaching, and various other things. Uh, I work as a web developer. I am also a campaign organizer for Fusion Party. And I'm also from the Pirates. So my my talk, I'm going to make it make an argument. Drew, you can start now. I'm, I'm going to make an argument that, uh, that can everyone see my slides okay? Yes. Yep. Excellent. I'm going to make an argument that uh, Fusion is a meta-modern political party. And so what, what does that mean? Well, this is going to be a very info-dense talk. I will apologize in advance. Metamodernism is an emerging movement in art, society, politics, and philosophy. The key principle is this idea of oscillation, that we can sort of revolve around things and that we always are revolving around things and that we should revolve around things. The uh, main kind of people involved in metamodernism are the Triple H community, hackers, hackers, hipsters, and hippies, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. And um, politically, we can see this as the Nordic ideology in um, exemplified in the Scandinavian countries, also known as Green Social Liberalism 2.0. So in the Nordic countries, they have a very good public health and education sector. They have an effective justice system based on rehabilitative justice. They have universal concern for progressive politics, environmentalism, climate change, but also balanced out by human rights and the democratic process. And finally, they have a well-regulated capitalist market and finance sector. So hence, green social liberalism. Uh, a little bit about the philosophy of metamodernism. It's this uh, idea that it's a dialectical synthesis between modernism and postmodernism, which integrates the two and uh, and sort of uh, transcends the issues with them both, where modernism presented this idea that there is a hard objective truth about reality. Postmodernism was a response to that, which said there is no hard objective truth about reality. Everything is subjective. Everything is relative. Metamodernism proposes almost like a compromise between the two, that there is a kind of intersubjective truth, which is functionally objective and operates at the subjective intersection of multiple truths, just like a, a Venn diagram. So we have this kind of both and thinking. So uh, the first demographic, who are we? We are hackers. Uh, hackers innovate and develop technological solutions. It's not just a person who legally gains access to computer systems. Uh, this, they produce software that engages the complexity of society and makes it manageable. And uh, they also make use of cultural capital and social capital by bypassing the old capitalist ways of distributing services and information by digitalizing and gamifying processes and finding novel applications of technology. The second demographic hipsters, they're not just people with a particular style of fashion. They're not just pretentious college kids who show off their supposedly good taste in music and art. Instead, they produce symbols that help us orientate ourselves and make sense of and find meaning in the world. Here you'll find artists, designers, thinkers, writers, bloggers, social entrepreneurs that develop ideas like post-humanism, transhumanism, complexity, network theory, participatory politics and social movements, economic critique, ecological and social resilience, personal development, organizational development, new gender and sexual relations, alternative forms of family community life. And they embody these thoughts by creating music, fashion, movies, books, and games. The third demographic is hippies. They're people who produce new lifestyles, habits, and practices, make life in a post-industrial society happier, healthier, and more enchanted. And these are people with highly developed skills in meditation, in contemplation, in bodily practice, in psychedelics, diet and physical training, profound forms of intimate communication and sexuality, simple life wisdoms that apply to our day and age. But you will find rational and research-based approaches here to psychedelics and eco-village and science-driven meditation and stress release practices. Uh, a good sort of hub example of modern hippie culture is Burning Man, with uh, communities spring up around the world in, in Australia that includes Modifier, Blazing Swan and Burning Seed, and there you will find MDMA-induced art projects, large, impressive, and meaningless structures that are built as temporary art projects for no other reason that they are fun and interesting. So, so what, what, what kind of unifies us? 
we are that there's kind of like a of some ideas floating around that we are a compilation of all these different intersecting identities some of us identify very strongly with with one or two labels some of us pick a million labels and can never decide and some people just say we should have no labels at all but uh, fundamentally we're each kind of have a have a post work relationship with the economy we operate in the precariat in the gig economy where um where it's not so important what we do we don't really define ourselves by that but rather who we want to become so uh like like any kind of <laughs> rationalist i want to present a mathematical model for social change which i've been playing for for a while bear with me um so we have a uh, hook's law here which is obviously you apply a force to a spring and then it goes out and oscillates and comes back and that looks awfully similar to our values framework in fusion where you can unlike a spring which is one dimensional here you it is you can go in either direction start from either end either the practical end or the ideal end the force is the initial idea that you propose and then you sort of sort of propel yourself through this process through each of the values and then then the retracting force pulls you back towards the start so you can go through this as many times as you like i'm going to skip the two uh alternative um other options out there so i want to talk to finally finish what is our program that um ultimately we have metamodernist has superior mimetic power that we will outcompete capitalism and to do so we have to adopt this kind of ironic sincerity or informed naivete and uh and adopt these six strands of politics democratization fellowship existential politics emancipation empiricism and an effective theory thank you Thank you, Miles. That uh, was a lot very quickly and ran into your question time, but thank you for getting through that. I'm here now. All right, we'll, we'll have you up in a minute, Cami. Uh, just before that, uh, we have uh, Laura Layton up next. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Um... How do I share a screen? Sorry, I've been stuck on Teams now for so long that I forget how to use Zoom. <laughs> Understandable. Excellent. It's okay. appearing. Uh, just give a short introduction if you help, and off you go. I'll just see if I can actually get this to properly show up first. There we go. Okay. So, um, Hi everyone, sorry, can't see me. Um, I'm friends with Miles and we know each other mainly through effective altruism. So he invited me to join tonight and um, basically reprise a lightning talk that I did for an EA event a few weeks ago. So I'm actually gonna talk about what I do for work, but in addition to my actual talk, I'm happy to take questions about EA and I in fact life sciences research more generally. I'm sorry that my voice is so screwed up and have a really bad cold. Um, so I'm a researcher at UQ and I work on mRNA therapeutics. I do need to say that I'm presenting in a personal capacity and not representing UQ. And I know there's a lot of people here who are big fans of um, science and evidence-based medicine and policy. So I thought I'd give a rundown on the whole mRNA vaccine thing as well as the other uses for this tech. So I think everyone has heard of mRNA vaccines by now, obviously, but many people aren't familiar with the underlying biology, as evidenced by anti-vaxxers freaking out about foreign chemicals and people advertising mRNA-free beef during the subsequent shitstorm. mRNA is not, in fact, a scary foreign chemical, but an intermediate form of genetic information that every cell in your body is making all day, every day. So you probably know that each of your cells contains a full copy of your genetic code in the form of DNA. But DNA is big and bulky, so it, it has to stay packaged up safely in the cell's nucleus. I think of it as being like a, a big recipe book that is so big that you leave it on the shelf, but there's photocopies of a few recipes floating around in your kitchen. And those photocopies are mRNAs. And just like you can photocopy a page once or a hundred times, there can be a few of these or a heap of them, and they're quite transient and disposable in nature. Their purpose is to carry the information from its storage form as DNA, to get made into proteins, which are the furniture and tools of the cell. So what does this have to do with vaccines? Well, a vaccine is basically a harmless piece of a pathogen that is designed to teach your immune system what a harmful virus or bacterium looks like, so that if you encounter that pathogen for real, 
you're already prepared. Usually it's a single protein, but sometimes it's a protein fragment. And sometimes it's whole bacteria or viruses that have been killed or made non-virulent. It's harmless, but then we mix it with a substance that pisses your immune system off, and then it goes and does its thing. So with mRNA vaccines, instead of injecting the proteins themselves, we inject mRNA encoding the proteins, and then your muscle cells or some peripheral immune cells will make the protein that is characteristic of the pathogen, and your immune system gets pissed off, goes and does its thing. And this sounds like it's adding extra steps, right? So why is not improvement? Well, designing and testing protein-based vaccines takes a really long time. Historically, it takes about two years to go from identifying the pathogen to having vaccine candidates that are ready to begin clinical trials. When the COVID-19 pandemic occurred, just as mRNA technology was maturing, it took about two months between the virus being sequenced and the first vaccine candidates entering phase one clinical trials. Scaling up manufacture of protein-based vaccines is also complicated with very different, each different vaccine having different equipment and expertise requirements. Whereas with mRNA vaccines, the manufacturing steps are the same, regardless of what the mRNA encodes. So if facilities and expertise exist for scale and production of mRNA vaccines, then this hugely increases the speed of a potential response to a future pandemic. And I actually mentioned this in my submission to the government COVID inquiry a while back, that investment in production infrastructure for mRNA is really important for this reason. But mRNA is useful for more than just making vaccines. I don't actually work on vaccines myself. mRNA researchers around the world, including my group, are working on drugs to treat genetic disorders, several new ways of treating cancer, and also drugs that may be alternatives to antibiotics in the future. And so I guess I, I think it's really important that people not be afraid of this technology. I think it's pretty unlikely that anyone in this group falls into that category, but I like to spread the word when I can that it's it's not scary. And I think in a lot of ways it is the future. And I'm very happy to take questions if anyone has. I've got a question. Yep, that was quick, so uh, feel free. Yeah. Um, can you talk a bit about the potential for applying RNA therapy, mRNA therapies targeting specific um, specific tissues, specific organs? Um, obviously, with the with the vaccines, there was a bit of a controversy about the idea that you needed the response to be primarily in the respiratory pathway rather than in the arm where the injection goes in. Sorry, my voice is just crapping out a little bit here. I'm actually still quite sick. So that's actually literally my project. I'm working on delivery at the moment. So basically this, this potentially has quite a long answer. There's several kinds of different antibodies. And so the one that you get when you inject a vaccine, any kind of vaccine is IgG, which is like a, a circulating immune response in your bloodstream. Arguably there is a higher degree of protection with IgA which is what you get more in the respiratory tract. So yeah, there are people... Stupid. Sorry? Sorry, uh, I missed so, something. So, so, someone was unmuted when they shouldn't have been. Carry on. Oh, sorry. Um, Yeah, so basically there are people actively working on ways to deliver mRNA vaccines via an inhalation route because then you would theoretically get a better mucosal IgA response in the respiratory tract. And then for the other means of delivery, a technology that we're working on at the moment, well, not me specifically, but a lot of labs, is changing the formulation of the lipid nanoparticle that encapsulates the mRNA. So basically by putting it into a different carrier, we might be able to direct it to different tissues, even if the route of administration is the same. And so that gets very technical. I'm happy to talk about it more later if people are interested, but it's in the early stages, but a very, very, very active area of research. All right. Thank you very much. And I won't stress your voice anymore with more questions. Thank you, Laura, so much. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I sound so crappy. I thought that I was less sick than I am, but so apparently good. not. Uh, if you would like to uh, stop sharing, we have two speakers left. That is Mark Miller and Cami Cordner hunt uh, Mark didn't respond to my thing before. So perhaps, Cami, if you'd like to uh, do yours now, and then we'll finish up with Mark after that. 
and you just have to unmute. The suspense is killing me. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for um, listening to my talk tonight. And I will try and be fit. I'll just put on the um, stopwatch. And um, I have just completed a... I, I'm Cammy Cordner Hunt, and I founded One Planet Party, which then joined Vote Planet. And we became one of the founding uh, parties of fusion. Uh, in my interest in um, politics, I have learnt a lot about the world and one of the things I became very passionate about and interested in was human rights. And so I've just completed a Master's of Human Rights and had in a dissertation and my dissertation is called The Unaccountability of Corporations in the Commitment of Human Rights Abuses. So what I found out, found was that um, here we are all over the planet trying to address human rights issues and in fact it doesn't matter how it's like putting your finger in the dike it doesn't matter how much we do to try our humanitarian um, exercises in war-torn countries everything we do um, we are just mopping up after really after corporations obviously st states nation states are also involved in abusing human rights but the um but the role of transnational corporations in all of those episodes is is really uh, very eviscerating to see firsthand. So I'll start with my um, abstract. So uh, it, my dissertation argues that transnational corporations have grown into great powers that challenge the ability of governments and collective bodies of governments like the UN to manage them. Their size and influence mean the harms that they are doing, and they're called TNCs throughout. So TNC stands for Transnational Corporation. The harms that TNCs are causing to human populations and environments are not being contained, nor mitigated, nor accounted for by law. As a result, TNCs have been committing violations of human rights with impunity and continue to do so. Um, so it, it actually just starts off with kind of fairly mild human rights uh, as I go through the chapters. Um, but and I talk about the history of corporations and how they operate by nature, which is to grow and grow and grow. <laughs> um, and that's what they have been doing ever since um, Thatcher and Regan in the 1980s um, collaborated on the idea that um, what the world needed was to let the market sort out all of the problems in the world. So therefore, give absolutely free reign to the market and reduce government intervention wherever possible in economics. And so as a result of that, corporations have just profited more and more and more and they've sought every possible avenue to grow bigger and profit more. And now we have corporations, for example, Nestle, which owns absolutely every tiny every large and tiny business involved in producing food from the centre of Switzerland, which is their headquarters, long fingers down to the Tierra del Fuego and every part of Africa where they're picking up their ingredients for all their food products. Um, so these, these companies actually have GDPs bigger than half the nations in the world, and they go into really small nations to um, help those nations uh, grow their GDPs. So, for example, through the world the international financial organizations such as the World Bank, the WTO, World Trade Organization, and the IMF, International Monetary Fund, these groups all work with corporations to go sending them into small countries or developing countries to help them develop whatever their assets are or resources are so that those countries can grow their GDP and join the global market. Uh, but and, and that's the ideal. Um, it's really wonderful. UN supports it totally. Um, however, what happens when they get in there, of course, is another thing. What we what you end up is slavery in supply chains, um, incitement to wars. Uh, the more unstable a country, the better corporations can profit themselves. It's called capital flight. The, the corporations go in to help the country 
build their um, assets and they end up uh, siphoning off the capital and sending it back to the north and they call it the global north, which is all the rich countries up in the north. Um, and the developing countries, we don't use that expression anymore. They're now called the global south. Australia is not a member of the global south. We are a member of the global north. Um, however, um, just generally speaking, South America, South Africa and a lot of... Um, equatorial countries are all struggling to develop and the corporations are going in to help them, but they are um, um, delivering carnage in the process, which that they profit from and those small nations struggle with uh, for generations. Um, that's five minutes. So uh, it's a really, really huge topic, <laughs> but I'm happy to answer any questions. Mm. Right, we'd have time for one quick question if someone has one. I will just say it's made me more political than ever. Um, it's made me I have a perspective on how politics works. Oh, there, I forgot to mention state capture. So politics own uh, governments all over the world. Um, they're completely captured by them. And that's why uh, the world is turning more and more uh, right wing and... Um, pugilistic and less and less concerned with human rights. Right. Thank you. Um, was that a quick question, Bryony? Yeah, quick question. Um, thanks, Cammy. Did you get, uh, is it, you know, the IMF used to do things like intentional lend money that they knew the country couldn't pay back, so then the, the you know, there would be structural adjustment, the corporate corporations could buy, you know, get off get the assets cheap and so on is that still happening yeah. or has yeah, look, there, that been cracked down on yeah look structural adjustment meant that a, a, a poor country had to do exactly what the imf told them to do so that um, a corporation could also profit as well as them and uh, that turned out to be such a disaster they don't have it anymore however uh, what they have now is global um they have investment treaties and they're pretty much exactly the same thing but um but structural adjustment programs had such a bad uh, pr they got rid of them and they've just done something else yeah yeah all right thank you very right. much for that okay. okay um so then we are now up to our final speaker for tonight and uh if you are ready i'll invite you to introduce okay. yourself and get away Okay, it's uh, Mark Miller here. Uh, Owen's asked me to talk um, on the challenges of the energy transition based on just a few reflections based on my experience in the power industry. Um, so basically, as I see it, I, I, I think there's been a lot of mis, uh, misunderstanding about what the process is. It's really, it, it's not really, a, a, the energy transition can't be planned. It needs to be negotiated. And this is because any chosen transition strategy has to have the begrudg begrudgingly accepted by a significant majority of stakeholders. Um, that's uh, basically, at least in a democratic society. So certainly in the area of electricity supply, um, this means a strategy that seem to be capable of um, delivering a significant reduction in emission in a timely manner. Steadily, won't result in the best increases of cost of electricity. To a significant degree, there are intervals of supply and it will not have an unacceptable level in markets. So that's what we go up the more common process to see how the design is required. The central renewables, all that fine around the plus by gas, solar, and wage is already in the rain. So, clearly, this has potential to do business in a manner. Uh, cost of electricity, cost of sovereign continues to fall. The biggest question is the cost of storage. The cost of battery storage is falling, but it's still relatively expensive. And particularly when you have to at times cover 
rare periods where you get long periods of low solar and low wind for mul multiple days, perhaps once or twice a year, where you need what they call really deep storage. And that's at the moment best covered by pumped hydro or peaking generation. Also, coal and gas, uh, gas fuel generators are capable of supporting the power system during faults because of the way they're connected. Renewable generators are due to all these and those special measures cost are required for this. So, reliability or it rely on an adequate level of Sorry to confirming jump in here. capacity, Mark. either battery. Um, you're you're breaking up a great deal. Would you like to turn yes. your video off and uh, hopefully you're you'll come through a bit more cleanly? Okay, can is that clearer? Uh, ho hopefully, uh, yeah, you were just you're you're chopping up a little bit. So if you want to go back a, a step okay. and uh, continue. Yep. Yeah. Okay. We'll start again with central. Sorry about the centralized renewables. Uh, this is where coal or gas fire generation would be replaced by large scale solar or wind, and that can uh, reduce emissions in a in a in a timely manner. Uh, cost of electricity, the cost of solar and wind continues to fall uh, extensively. Cost of storage is the biggest problem here, particularly what we call deep storage, where you have low wind and solar for a number of days, particularly in winter. And that's the one where it's the, it's the most expensive to cover. And we'd probably be looking at, at this stage, pumped hydro or peaking generation. Also, coal and gas fuel generating units are capable of supporting the power system during faults, but renewable generation, because they're connected in a different way, uh, can't do it to the same extent. So there's extra costs there involved. Uh, but the biggest issue here, of course, is local environmental impact, because this, this approach requires the building of large energy farms and construction of high voltage lines in rural areas, and that's creating major issues for rural stakeholders. Another approach that's starting to be talked about more is, the is nuclear with the replacement of coal-fired generation on site. Clearly that in the longer term uh, can, can reduce emissions towards zero, but it could, could result in significant delays in that being occur occurred. Uh, which would, might rely on coal generation remaining in service longer. The cost of electricity here is a difficult issue on this approach. Based upon industry estimates, the cost of this strategy should be comparable to the renewable approach. However, these estimates need to be treated with scepticism. The most recent nu nuclear reactors have cost or expected to cost of the order of two to three times the initial estimate and, and take two to three times longer to build than initially estimated. Now, the, the approach of small scale modular reactors has been raised, uh, but again, this is an untested approach. And again, we have to be very cautious with any estimates. Um, local environment impact, again, this is where, where it's a big positive because it would affect only a limited number of locations. The old, the old coal-fired generating stations. However, here it's likely to be a significant issue. For instance, on the at Lake Macquarie in uh, north of Sydney, to replace the current coal-fired generation, you'd need to install probably something in the order of 10 small modular reactors. And I think there could be some significant local issues there. Uh, they, these are theoretically safer than current reactors due to the use of passive safety systems. However, the failure of safety systems for the, for the Fukushima reactors means that the local communities may still be concerned. Uh, selection of site for a uh, long-term storage of nuclear waste is also likely to be controversial, not because I believe it's unsafe, but I think we've just seen the problems when trying to find long-term storage for the low-level waste from the Lucas Heights reactor. Another approach, which is the other extreme, is distributed energy, where you largely attempt to replace centralized generation by small scale rooftop solar and coordinated small scale storage, either in homes or in community batteries and storage systems. Uh, again, the local 
environmental impact is likely to be small, it will be quite acceptable. However, the cost again is a problem here because of the small scale of generation, uh, higher costs due to the loss of economies of scale. Uh, so basically from that, the question comes about choosing the best approach and it's become clear to me that it's not a, a, an engineering economic optimization process. It's rather a process uh, that is that determines the best mix of approaches, you know, in a messy in, in a messy way to achieve a, a compromise which a majority of stakeholders could live with. And I think that's the difficulty of the process we're facing now. I hope that was a bit clearer, was it? Yes, it was. Thank you, Mark. Um, and I'll actually ask a quick question just to clarify based on some of the uh, smattering earlier. Um, you you started off with the point that uh, any energy transition is ultimately one that has to be negotiated due to the diversity of partners involved. Uh, yeah. It sounded, and I'm just clarifying because of the, the breakup there, that the conclusion you were driving towards is that ultimately a multi-source mix for energy is realistically the most or possibly only viable solution. I think there has to be a mix of strategies, uh, but you have to be careful with that. Um, because clearly, I think one of the issues with the mix of strategies is the issue that you've got to make sure that all sectors of the community bear the burdens of this. And so, for instance, to adopt simply the centralised renewable strategy means that the rural communities are facing the burdens and the urban communities are facing the benefits without pulling their weight. So I think there's got to be a balancing across that entire strategy. And Thank but you. again, it's not it's not an, a simple optimization process. It's a it's a relatively messy political process. Yeah, uh, we have one question from Andrea. Thank you, Drew, uh, and thanks for the talk, Mark. I was just wondering, from a technical grid engineering perspective, could we? And thanks for including um, uh, mention of nuclear energy in there. Could we negotiate a transition where we start building nuclear power plants today, keep building renewables at pace, considering that we are looking to electrify the rest of our economy, so we might need a tripling of electricity? Could we negotiate uh, increasing uh, all these different types of um, power sources as we scale up? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's a very good point because I was going to add to it because but with five minutes I didn't have time that really electricity only represents 40% of the task. The other 60% are in big issues like steel making, cement making, uh, ammonia and many of the others. And a lot of those are going to require electrification, which makes the task of in the transition and the electrical side even harder. But you're right that there are that you've got to look at the whole thing, not just the electricity supply sector. And there's possibilities that you've that those sort of synergies could work from there. Uh, there's hydrogen, of course, also that could. That is the other issue that I didn't cover here is the other strategy. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Um, now, it has been an hour and a half. Uh, so this is more or less the end of the formal part of uh, this meeting. Uh, we will hang around for a little while and don't go just yet. Um, uh, for any speakers that are willing to stick around, uh, we'll uh, just continue to facilitate a space here to chat and uh, we'll let, let people ask questions as they raise their hands in order. We'll, we'll if for anyone who stays around, we'll, we'll let that ha keep happening. Um, and before we finish the recording and uh, just wrap, wrap those things up, I'd like to note, since uh, there's a lot of people here, um, in the next few weeks, uh, we'll be putting out a notice uh, for an SGM for the party. Uh, this is a going to be a very boring, very administrative thing uh, to make it a, a few cleanup changes, but one in particular is to change the quorum for our uh, party's general meetings to a more appropriate number for the size of our organization. This is a challenge that cost us three months of organizing last year, and we need to meet it at least once to change it. So when you see the SGM notice, please 
do take note. We want to get it done once and not have to do it again. Uh, otherwise, uh, thank you all for being here. We will proceed on to questions in a minute. And uh, it has been fantastic to see everyone here and to hear all of the speakers this week, this month. Uh, thank you. I have a quick procedural point. I want to share the talks list. Um, if anyone wants to see the names and contacts for follow-up, does anyone have objections to that from the speakers with getting your email shared? I don't. Okay. No. I'm fine with that. Fine with that. Yeah, fine with me. I'll, uh, I'll put a link to the talks list in chat then. All right. I'll uh, stop the recording and we'll go to general question chat time. Thank you.